everyone. Welcome to Servant of Christ Ministries. In today's video, we are going to examine a portion of scripture that many individuals have mishandled in their attempt to justify their legalistic view of obtaining salvation by works of the law. According to the book of Galatians, Paul strongly opposes the Judaizers attempt to pervert the one true gospel of salvation. So what doctrine did the Judaizers teach that was so heretical? According to Acts chapter 15 it reads, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And later on in verse 5, they add to that statement by saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So not only were the Judaizers requiring the Gentiles to be circumcised, they were also requiring that they keep all the laws given by Moses in order to obtain salvation. Sadly, this heresy continues to deceive people. The Judaizers are not a thing of the past. In fact, many religious groups today still hold to this works-based system as a means of earning salvation. Groups like Mormons, Roman Catholics, Jehovah's Witnesses, Black Hebrew Israelites, and Muslims are all religious-based systems primarily focused on your ability to keep laws in order to be righteous or earn favor in the sight of God. It is only Christianity that teaches that your works are not, nor will they ever be good enough. In fact, according to Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6, it states, But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. In other words, our good deeds amount to nothing when it comes to earning salvation. The gospel's primary focus is to draw the listener to the only one who can provide salvation, and that person is Jesus Christ. There is no other way to obtain salvation apart from Christ. Many of these groups, if not all, are in the habit of twisting and misusing Bible verses as a means of deceiving those who are less knowledgeable about God's Word. It is my purpose in this video to teach and equip you on how to properly navigate the Word of God. Therefore, I will give you a tool that I created called the Three Zone Rule, which helps you to understand Scripture in context so as to not be deceived by false teachers. Let's get started. First, let us review the scripture that is often misused to promote false doctrines. In Matthew chapter 19 verse 17, Jesus Christ states, So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is, God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. The false teacher usually reads this verse and stops and says, You see, in order to obtain eternal life, you must keep the commandments. And they strut in their pride feeling justified in their doctrine, thinking that they have just won the conversation. Yet, it isn't until the scripture is read in its context that this prideful strut immediately becomes a walk of shame. Let us now apply the three-zone rule approach to this scripture in order to gather the proper context. Zone number one. In our first zone, we want to always consider the overall theme and purpose of the Bible. The primary focus of the Bible, along with creation, is to bring glory to God and His character. It is revealed in scripture that God created Adam and Eve to multiply upon the earth and live forever in his presence. But when they disobeyed God, sin entered the world. And because of sin, death flourished. And because of God's character, mankind would be doomed to suffer the penalty of sin by the hand of God. Yet, because of his love, God also provided a means of escape from his judgment. From then on, the focus that continues to be revealed throughout Scripture is the way by which God redeems His people, and that way is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Zone number two. You must always understand the purpose of the specific book from which the verse is being quoted from. In this case, the book of Matthew. In the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, Matthew begins with the entire lineage of Adam leading up to Jesus Christ. The reason Matthew does this is to reveal the promised Messiah from Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, which states, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is a prophecy concerning how Jesus Christ would destroy the grip that death had on humanity because of sin, and how Jesus Christ would crush and kill the serpent permanently, while at the same time suffering temporarily at the hands of Satan. Therefore, the focus of the book of Matthew is concerned with recording events as inspired by the Holy Spirit about the way Jesus Christ lived, died, and resurrected in accordance to all the prophecies in the Old Testament. And finally, zone number three. 
Zone number three is to understand the context in which the statement is made so as to properly divide the word of God accurately. To do this, we will not only read Matthew chapter 19 and verse 17, but we will read the entire context of the conversation that took place between Jesus and the rich young ruler so as to debunk the false doctrine of a works-based salvation. In Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 26, it reads, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is, God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly I say to you, that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Let us now walk through each verse to understand this scripture correctly. In verse number one, the rich young ruler asks the question, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Notice, the young rich ruler immediately appeals to his works and ability by asking what he can do to inherit eternal life. Keep this in mind as it will become very important later in this dialogue. Jesus then responds in the next verse by stating, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is, God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. There are two points I want to expound upon in this verse. First, notice that Jesus did not say, don't call me good. Many Jehovah's Witnesses misquote this verse in an attempt to demonstrate that Jesus wasn't God. But notice that Jesus didn't say don't, rather he asked why. If you find yourself debating a Jehovah's Witness about this topic, you should ask them, is Jesus Christ good? If they answer yes, then they have just admitted that Jesus Christ is God. And if they answer no, they have contradicted scripture because it is necessary for Jesus to be good and perfect in order to atone for the sins of mankind. Next, Jesus Christ states, If you will enter into life, keep the commandments. Remember, I asked earlier to keep in mind the rich young ruler's question. The reason that this is important is because Jesus Christ is responding to that question of what the young ruler must do to inherit eternal life. In other words, What can the young ruler do in his own strength to inherit eternal life? The rich young ruler then asks Jesus to be more specific as to which commandments he must keep. Jesus Christ then begins to quote the last half of the Ten Commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The rich young ruler was probably feeling pretty good at this moment because he replied, All these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? In other words, the young ruler is saying that he has met these requirements. Jesus Christ in his infinite wisdom does something important. He points out the weakness of the young ruler when he states, If you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. The Greek word used here for the word perfect is teleos, which is defined as complete. In other words, Jesus tells him that if he wants to be fully perfect, he must give up his riches and follow him. Why is this significant? Because Jesus just exposed that this man was guilty of idolatry. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3, it reads, You shall have no other gods before me. According to Jesus Christ, in Luke chapter 16 and verse 13, he states, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The word mammon is of Chaldean origin, meaning treasure or riches. Therefore, Jesus just exposed that the rich young ruler was not as righteous as he supposed. And this is why the rich young ruler walks away sorrowful, 
because he was not willing to part with his riches for God. After Jesus' interaction with the rich young ruler, he turns to his disciples and asks them, Assuredly I say to you, that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The reason why it is so hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of God is because their riches keep them distracted from serving God, and their primary focus becomes either increasing their riches or holding on tightly to what they already have. In other words, it becomes their God. In verse 25, we are given a little insight into what the apostles were thinking when witnessing this conversation take place between Jesus and the rich young ruler. It states, When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? Why did the apostles respond this way? It was viewed by the Jews of that time that if a man was wealthy, it was because God had blessed him with those riches for his righteousness and obedience to the law. So, when Jesus exposes this man before the apostles, their entire world view is turned upside down, which is why they ask the question, who then can be saved? In their eyes, if a rich young Jew, who was seemingly blessed by God, was not worthy of eternal life, what hope does anyone have? In verse 26, Jesus reveals to them the gospel in one impactful sentence when he states, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. In other words, it is impossible for men to obtain salvation by their own ability to keep the law because they would always fail at one point or another. In James chapter 2 and verse 10 it reads, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. This is why God ends his statement by saying, But with God, all things are possible. Simply put, salvation is only made possible in our lives by God. This is why Jesus Christ died on the cross as a perfect sacrifice. Our salvation is only made available because Jesus lived a perfect life in obedience to everything in the law that the Lord required. And he suffered the punishment that we deserve so as to make us righteous in God's sight, allowing us to one day stand before God's face without the fear of being condemned. I pray that this Bible lesson was helpful. And it is my hope that if you ever encounter a false teacher using scripture incorrectly, that you institute the three zone rule. Remember, zone number one. Remember the purpose of the Bible. Zone number two, remember the reason for which the author is writing the book. And zone number three, remember the context of the chapter from which the verse originates. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. If you have any scriptures that you need help placing back into context, you can either place your questions in the comment section or you can email me directly at servantofchristministries at gmail.com. Until next time, God bless.